last week's stuff up already on the internet. So um, there, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll do it a week behind. Like this week's will be next. I'll put it up next next week. So um, anyway, just. Jeff Medgard, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're in James chapter three, and we're finally to a new, a new little thought here. It's not a new thought; it's an old, old thought, but it's uh, it works with it. Uh, chapter three, verse thirteen. Um, I can remember years ago, years and years ago, I did a little bit of a study here in Sunday school about wisdom out of Proverbs. I doubt, I, I would suggest possibly everybody that's here today was here then as well. You know, Maydell's no longer with us and some of them, so that wouldn't count, but um, we don't remember, I'm sure, probably much of anything that was even said. I would give it that I don't even. Um, maybe some some day we need to go over another thing such as that because of how important it really is. But that's what we're getting into today. If I was to ask you to define wisdom, would you be able to? I'm not necessarily talking about the dictionary definition of wisdom. I don't always go by a dictionary definition of something because sometimes they have it wrong, and I can prove that. Look up um, create in a dictionary, and it says to make. That's one of the definitions. That's not correct. If you create, you've made from nothing into something. That's why everything that was created was created, because it was from nothing spoke into existence. That's create. And then he took that dirt and put man together, and he says, and we made, I made man. Let's make man in our image. It's always made, made, made. There's only one spot, and that's in the New Testament where it talks about man being created. It's talking about being created for his glory. Now, we were made in the image of God. How? God putting something together that already existed to make something called man. What a tremendous thought. After he made man, then he said everything was great. Before that, it was good. Then it was great after he made man. What a tremendous thought. And the dictionary defines that wrong. So, that being said, if you were asked, could you define wisdom? I would put it this way. The ability to graciously use knowledge. Graciously use knowledge. One of the wisest things I ever did was when I was a little kid. I was, I don't know, a, a, a little squirt but I remember it vividly. We were at a church league softball tournament thingy dealy. There were a whole pile of, I know thingy dealy isn't a real biblical term, so excuse me for that. Um, but <laughs> there was a whole pile of different ball games being played. And ours got over. I wasn't playing, obviously, but I believe Dad was. And we took off for 
the vehicle we were going to go home. Okay. I was out in front, not paying any attention. Dad said, stop. And I was left with the choice. Keep running or stop. I stopped in a car went by. It was hidden from me by another vehicle, but Dad, being taller, was able to see over it and know it was coming, and I, I had no clue. That was probably the wisest thing that I ever did. Okay? For, well, some people will be going, man, dude, you should just kept going. Then we wouldn't have to worry about you anymore. <laughs> uh, so to them, maybe it wouldn't be, but why? Because I graciously used knowledge that somebody else had imparted to me. Dad could see the car coming. I didn't do it. I didn't stop because I was something great. I stopped because he said to stop and obeyed him. That's wisdom. I'll bet you that was probably in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 years ago, and I still have to call that probably the wisest thing I did. <laughs> Not a good track record. <laughs> That's a definition that I would take for wisdom. Now, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Graciously using knowledge, a utilization of that which I know to be the case with all the grace that only God can give. There's wisdom, and that's what he's talking about right there. Wisdom is misunderstood in today's society to huge degrees. In our society today, college professors are considered wise. Now, let me throw out some examples here and see if you consider this to be wise. A college professor saying that over millions and now into the billions of years, we went from a little slimy amoeba to other animals to human, and believing that. Is that wise? That's a misuse of knowledge, a complete misuse of knowledge, and they know it, okay? Having them say with emphasis that there is no God and you are responsible only to you. If you don't believe this kind of stuff is being said in the colleges, go check it out. <laughs> There's a reason why it's classified as a liberal arts college. That is a reality. And they will propagate their idealism. Yet these professors are considered wise because they know a lot. They're misusing information. They're misusing knowledge. And understanding is altered because of the way that they engage their, children, their, their students. And now we're seeing that clear down into the preschool ages. Probably watching the news within the last week, week and a half, have heard about this seven-year-old kid that they surgically castrated so that he could be changed into a girl. Seven years old. And it's okay because that's wise. No. 
I will fight against that tooth and nail. Don't try to convince me that the people doing that, that are teaching these kids about sexuality that young, are wise. They're fools. There's a passage in Scripture that says this, pretending to be wise, they became fools. Pretending to be wise. Who is wise and understanding among you? Could I throw out a possible answer to that? People that are too stupid to get it wrong. What do you mean by that? Well, people who haven't studied so much that they have misrepresentation drilled into them and the little knowledge they have, they, they correctly engage. They're the ones that are wise. Now, let's put this in a spiritual sense. I mean, we've talked about this already in a worldly sense, but let's, let's put this in a spiritual sense because this gets extremely important. If I think I know everything I need to know about the Bible and I engage people inaccurately because of it, am I being wise? Not at all. I have thought this over Fri Friday when I came home. I was all by myself driving home. knowing that somebody with whom I had worked for years was now past that end-of-life stage, most likely not having accepted Christ. Okay? My thought was, what could I have done different? What could I have said or done differently that might have brought him to that point. And I know I'm not supposed to sit back and beat myself up over this kind of stuff. That's You get out there and have something like that happen and see how easy it is to just not let that go through your head. It's If you have a heart for people, it will go through your head. What could I have done differently that this man might be in heaven today? Because I may have done something unwise hmm. is wisdom important <laughs> in a spiritual sense oh trust me it is you'll find nothing more important than to be wise in the way we do things now what does he say here let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. What works is he talking about? I'm going to propose this. Everything that we do. I don't care whether it's talking to somebody, going to the store, stopping off at the bank, raking leaves. I mean, how long could the list be? Hordes of things. Everything that we do, done in wisdom. Why? Because we have everything we need handed to us on a silver platter right here. In order to really get an understanding of this, you have to go into Proverbs. But I want to centralize on just one verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not the end of wisdom. It's what starts to teach us about wisdom. And here we see Who's wise? An understanding among you. 
those that fear the Lord. I'm not going to do that wrong because if I do, God is going to, you know, fill in the blanks for both of them. Scared of what God would do. I'm going to back this up with a with a long ideal, and I, I I understand we don't have by any means the time to go through this. What did it take us in Sunday evenings, years and years to do? But the Israelites feared the Lord, and God allowed them to come into the Promised Land victorious. Okay. Later on, what happened? They forgot about him and didn't care what he would do if they did what he said not to do. They didn't any longer fear the Lord. And what happened? They were destroyed, they were put into captivity, and they never regained until 19... Yeah, yeah. I was going to come up with a date, and I wasn't. I, I was not ready to commit to one. Thank you. Um, where then they finally got to be a nation again because they did not fear the Lord. Now the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What did they do? Was it wise for them to worship false gods? Not at all. Was it wise for them to tell God, I don't want you as my ruler. I want a king like the rest of the nations around us? Not at all. Was it wise to do all these different things that they rebelled against God? Not in the least. And it was interesting as God would pound them silly and cause the Philistines to come in and beat up on them and cause Assyria to come in and beat up on them cause um, Babylon to come in and beat up on them and, and all these different people would come from different angles and, and pound them around a while. And what would they do? They would turn back to God for a little bit because they feared him for a moment. <laughs> you get beat up by somebody, you fear them a little bit. And that's kind of what was going on. I don't want to do that. And then they would go back to living a life however they wanted to live it, and that's what the book of Judges is about. And then God would have to work on them all over again, and then it would cycle some more and some more and some more, and it all started with this. There came a generation that didn't know anything about God, and they had no reason to fear what they did not know. The fear of the Lord, in fact, is the beginning of wisdom because it alters how I live my life. Who's wise among you? I'll tell you right now who's wise among you. Those that fear God. Anybody else may have all sorts of knowledge, and they may be very knowledgeable, but knowledge and wise and wisdom are two separate entities entirely wisdom is the proper use of accurate knowledge and the displaying thereof that's why he says who's wise and understanding let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom We are two-thirds of the way through, and I've done one verse. Maybe I get too excited about this stuff. It's this is I, Back when I started the book of James, I said this is my, one of my favorite books of study right here because it puts shoe leather to Christianity. Okay, well, we're going to move on. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts do not boast and lie against the truth why 
Why? Look at the next verse because it's demonic. That's the kind of wisdom that is from Satan, simply put. You have truth, and you take that truth and you alter it, which makes it what? <laughs> A lie. And lies are not of God, they're of Satan. Now this altered truth that makes you look wise in man's eyes is nothing more than information misrepresenting the reality of what should be. And you suddenly have lost wisdom, but man and the world and society call that wise. That's what they call wise. They would look at a Christian and consider them to be absolutely stupid. Now, if you don't believe it, engage a, a, an atheist in talk about the Word of God. They know more than you think about the Word of God, but it's all misrepresented and worldly. 100%. I was looking at a, an, an article this morning, a, a whole page of information that a, that a guy had put out, a guy that I know personally, and I wished I'd have knew where he was because he lived in Olympia when I was in Rochester, and I could have gone to his house and engaged him face to face. Oh, that had been great. <laughs> um, but... The whole thing was about how God says that um, all this different stuff is wrong that the world would say is good, and what the world says is bad is good. I, I can't come up with all the examples he had. It was a long page of, of stuff. I was reading it, the article, and it was rather in-depth. I, I try to keep up on some of that kind of stuff. And, Sometimes it's hard to retain everything in this little pile of thing I got up here. Huh? Noodles. noodles. Okay, I'll give it that. <laughs> Q-tip colored noodle. <laughs> Dirty Q-tip colored noodle. Uh, <laughs> but you know they're they're filled with knowledge inaccurately. Therefore. They cannot be wise because knowledge of inaccuracy enforces a lie. Okay. You can't live a lie and be wise. Not in a biblical sense, you can't. That's why... If you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast against the truth. This wisdom does not be descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and what else does it say? Demonic. That's the root of it right there. It's self-gratifying and demonic. And what does Satan insist that we do? Self-gratify. He's done it all the way down through the ages. He did it with Adam and Eve. Nah, God didn't say that. He lied. Yes, he did say that. Hmm. So he's propagating a lie right there. You want to be, you, you eat this stuff and you'll be like God. Self-gratifying. Now I don't need to go through God Self-gratifying. Is this not what he's talking about right here? And it's still the same thing. The wisdom of our world is, just a second, the, the wisdom of our world is as demonic as it can possibly get. Go ahead. And that is the father of lies. Of course. So everything he says, basically, has a lie in it. 
he'll he'll take some truth and and you, you notice cults will do this too tells you where they're from uh, <laughs> cults will do this but they take the truth and they alter it to sound good as a lie i wish i'd have i'm if i'd have stopped at walmart yesterday while we were out i'd have picked up a printer cartridge and then i could have printed that page off and actually had it here for you to see i don't i wish i have it i had it because i would i would get a little more explicit as to what it says you know well it, it's okay it'll be kind of too late but i'll, I'll send what i I'll, I'll send some stuff that that peripherals of that paper um and you can just read it for yourself. If anybody else would like it, I could do the same thing. Diana can see it on my computer. It's okay. Um, but, but what a tremendous tidbit of knowledge that I am either wise, either, not along with, but either wise in the world's eyes or wise before God. There's no two ways about it. I was told one time by a friend, Dinah would know who it was. We lived right next to him in, in Rochester. And their family and our family got along absolutely great. And he told me, man, you're one of the wisest people I ever met. I thought, oh, great. <laughs> That's all I need to look wise to somebody who's Because it doesn't wash. <laughs> you can't have both. You cannot be wise before God. And fear the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. And still look wise to the world around you. You can't do it. That's why everything in the book of Proverbs that says this is wisdom, that is folly. The that is folly bit is always something worldly, and the wisdom part is always something godly. Always. You will not find it different because they cannot go together. The, the wisdom of the world is demonic and it's self-seeking. God's wisdom brings glory to him. You can't have both. It's as annoying to me as having somebody call me religious. <laughs> oh, I hate that. <laughs> don't do it. I know what they mean, but stop it already. It's not right. For where, this is verse 16 now, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, and every evil thing are there. What kind of evil thing? Every evil thing. Why? Because it's demonic. Now, you want to tamper with demons? You want to play the game? I, I suggest if you do, you better check your heart. Because most likely... You need to be saved. If you want to play the game with demons, that should be the last thing we ever want. I, I, I could go on about this. I've got, I want to finish this chapter and I've got 11 minutes to do it. I wonder if I can beat the gun. I, I can go the rest of the time on verses we've already covered, so I've I got to be careful. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Okay, there's number one. First, it's pure. What does that mean? How can wisdom be pure? By not being unholy. Where is my wisdom found? I know an awful lot more than some people involving electrical systems and how they work. 
okay? I'm no teacher to that regard. The reason why is there's people that know a whole lot more than me. But might possibly somebody who doesn't know as much as me consider me to be wise in that area? Possibly. I don't want that. What happens when somebody says you're wise in, I don't know, whatever? Really? Cool. I'm wise. What am I doing? Getting a big head for one thing. I'm looking at me. Somebody says, you're biblically wise. You live your life the way a Christian should live their life. And I say what? Glory to God. Glory to God. You see the difference in that alone? It's first pure, then peaceable. Why? Because it's not about me. Worldly wisdom says, I want me first. And I'll knock you down if I have to to get there. It's not peaceable. It is the epitome of the opposite of peaceful. It is rebellious. But godly wisdom is peaceable. I want you closer to God. Therefore, I'm nothing. You know, just like that song we sing so often, Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. No, it, there's reality in that. Put Jesus first, others second, myself last, and I'm living wisely before God. I'm applying Proverbs to my life. It's gentle. I'm not going to beat you down. Or I'm going to. If I'm looking to build myself up by making you look smaller, then I am engaging worldly wisdom, which, as we've established, is demonic. And I sit back here and look at myself, and I say, hmm, I've got this stuff figured out. No, 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 no. Dare not. Willing to yield and full of mercy and good fruits. I'm speeding through that a little bit because I want to talk about that good fruits bit. What kind of fruit? There's two kind of fruit in the life of an active believer. Okay? What do you mean two kinds of fruit? There's two kinds of fruit. Here they are. The only two kinds of fruit in a person who's right with God. One is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faithfulness, not gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control. I think I got them. There should be seven of them. I think I got them. I have to go back and look. Galatians 5. Yeah, look, look them up for yourself, okay? That's one kind of fruit in the believer's life, okay? Then we are called to do what? Bear fruit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit and his fruit in our life, spreading out to the people around us. And there's the other kind of fruit. That's what he's talking about right here. Might I suggest both of those? I hope I haven't dipped in too deep and tried to express this in a way that's 
not understandable for people. That's not what I'm trying to do this morning. Sometimes there are things that are hard to figure out how to stand up here and teach. But if I could say this, if you want to be wise, let the Holy Spirit work in your life and then use that work in your life to express that love to others. And you will be wise before God. Not self-seeking. Not demonic. There's two distinct types of wisdom, and all wisdom is one or the other. You know, you might have people that you think of as very wise. I can think of some that, boy, I wish I had their wisdom. problem is I'm not them. I don't need their wisdom. I need God's wisdom. If you understand what I'm saying by that, let's be the kind of people that want God's wisdom, not that person's wisdom or the world's wisdom. And do things as God tells us to do them. And then we have to go with the rest of it, without partiality and without a hard word, hypocrisy. What is the biggest accusation of the, of the church today? Full of hypocrites. And you know what? It's an accurate description. I believe it to be an accurate description. You can't blah, 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 blah. But I can. I'm right with God and everything's great. And I'll do whatever gratifies me, but you can't. No, no, no. When the Bible says, be perfect as I'm perfect, or be holy as I'm holy, he means just that. And that's not for just all y'all, it's for me too. Yeah, hillbilly bouncing out there is good. Shows I'm human. <laughs> I thought about that. 30, almost 40 years since I've been in Kentucky, and I still can't draw any of that. There's certain things that have never left me. Ah. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. There is Christianity with feet. He says, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who will give liberally. That's what it's all about. How can I live my life for Christ and be wise in the world's eyes? Dallas Holm, a singer, wrote, I believe he wrote it, a song. And it went something like this, and I don't, it's been so long since I've heard it that I don't really remember all the words, but there were certain words that said this I'll be a fool for you, Jesus. Crazy in love with that above. It's all right with me. But we don't want to look like a fool to those around us. And we try to look wise to those around us. And we've stepped into a category where a Christian should never, ever find themselves. Not concerned over being a fool for Jesus. It's no fun. I want to look wise. I want to look like somebody who somebody can come up to and say, there's a wise man. No. Don't let it be among us that this church ever finds itself in that situation. But rather that they would look at us and say, boy, what a bunch of fools. When really, 
before God. We are the ones that are, that are wise. What does it take to be a fool for Jesus? To be an idiot? No. To be obedient. And the world will make us appear as fools. It is an absolute and it's a given that if we do this, that's what they're going to think. You know what we call it in our world today? I think it's inaccurate, but this is what we call it. Persecution. You don't think I'm an idiot. Well, you are then. <laughs> you really are. You don't have to work at it. <laughs> Be one right. Otherwise, we're being a hypocrite. Wow. Think on that for a second. Either I am wise the way God wants me to be wise, or I am a hypocrite. And it verifies that the church is full of hypocrites, and that's why people won't come. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And I noticed with many situations in my life, it's not up to me to get anybody to make peace with God. I have to live peaceably with them. But it's not my job to make them have peace with God. That's between them and God, and it's the Holy Spirit's job, not mine. All I can do is tell them where they can go for that peace. Made it kind of to the end. I could work on this another week easy. Don't want to. I just wish we had a real grasp of this. It's hard. It's hard. It's not easy to be wise when it comes to the reality of Christianity. We want to look wise to people, and we dare not. We dare not, not by the standard given here. Let's close with prayer. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we don't understand. We don't know, and we don't follow correctly sometimes. But Lord, help us. Give us wisdom that only you can give. Give as needed. Help us to throw away any desire to be wise before the world and only care about wisdom before you that we might follow you accurately and without hypocrisy. Thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. In your name, amen.